Hi, I'm Tony Northrup and this is a free tutorial for the Fujifilm X-T20. It's a long tutorial, probably more than an hour, but don't sweat it because you can look in the description down below and skip forward to the part of the tutorial that you want to really focus on. You might even find yourself going back to watch parts more than once. I suggest you grab your camera and you work alongside me. When I do something, you do it too. That helps your hands actually learn how to do the buttons and settings and everything. If you have a different camera, if you want to send your friends to this tutorial, send them to this shortcut, stp.io slash tutorials. We have tutorials for more than like 30 different modern cameras. I'm going to cover everything that I think is core to getting great pictures. I'm not going to cover stuff like using the different filters that are built into the camera. My philosophy is if you want to make something black and white or sepia toned, it's better to do that either on your computer or on your smartphone with Instagram or Snapseed or something like that rather than try to do it in camera. First up, let's talk about the physical body of the camera, getting it assembled. You can see my camera's already assembled, but I'll take it apart for you so you can make sure you put it together right the first time. The battery goes into the bottom. There's a little switch here that you'll pull back towards the back of the camera. It'll flip open on a spring. Then you'll take your battery. You'll line up the orange dot on the bottom here with the orange marker here and slide that all the way in. Also notice the SD card is down here too, right where it should be hidden away. Your SD card is your digital film. When you get that, you'll put the label towards the front of the camera. Slide it all the way in until it clicks. You can see there's a little diagram in there that can help you remember which way it's aligned. I always put it in wrong the first time. When you got those in there, close that door and then flip that switch forward. Your camera does not come with an SD card, so you have to buy at least one. And I would suggest getting a bigger one because at some point you're going to fill it up and that's going to be frustrating. And the bigger it is, the less frequently you'll fill it up. So. 128 gigs is not too much. You can pick up an inexpensive SD card at the link here, stp.io slash SD. When you see those links, you can use them to shop on Amazon and I get a few pennies out of every dollar. But if you shop somewhere else, that's okay too. No hard feelings. Um, you can spend more and get a more expensive SD card. And that can help if you're shooting a lot of action. This camera specifically can start to, to buffer where it starts to slow down when it's shooting if you're shooting continuously and shooting action. So a faster SD card can help. But if you're just shooting casually one or two shots at a time or shooting landscapes or something, don't hesitate to get an inexpensive but larger capacity SD card. It can be a better value for you. This camera will burn through batteries. If you're out and about when you're traveling or on vacation or something, you will probably run out of batteries before the end of the day. So I would suggest picking up at least one extra battery and keeping it charged. You can use this link down here, stp.io slash xt 2 battery to pick one up. It, I know it says XT2 battery and not XT20 battery, but the two cameras use the same battery, so that's fine. You can use your XT2 batteries on this too. I will say something that really helps is that this camera supports USB charging, just like your phone does, does just like your smartwatch does. So what you can do is flip this little door on the left-hand side here and see that little USB port there? You can hook up one of those USB battery chargers or you can get a car charger for USB. It's a micro USB port. Plug it right in there and the camera will charge. It might take a little bit longer than putting the battery on the charger, but it's so convenient when you're, when you're traveling. I really appreciate you including that. Fuji. Let's go into the menu system and I'll show you how to turn on high performance mode or turn it off. High performance mode makes the camera overall perform better. Focuses faster, the viewfinder looks better, but it burns through more batteries. So it's the kind of conscious choice that you want to make on a daily basis as to whether you take advantage of that or whether you try to make the batteries last a little bit longer. This is the first time we use the menu. So the menu button is right here in the middle of the directional pad. You'll push that. And you can see on the left side, there's a variety of different categories, six different categories that we can pick from here. For this, we're going to go down to the wrench icon. This is where most of your settings are. And then down here, you'll see power management. So scroll down to power management and then scroll to the right. Now you can see a couple of options here. Auto power off is set to two minutes. That's the time the camera takes to automatically turn off. You can set that lower, but what I would suggest doing is turning the camera off every single time you use it. Instead, if you want to change the height to high performance mode, you can scroll down. You'll see performance is set to standard. Again, that's slowing everything down a little bit for you. Scroll to the right, and then you can select high performance. And with that set, again, the camera performs better, but it burns through batteries faster. So if you're trying to make it through a day of travel, set it to standard. Now, I just showed you how to change the auto power off. The camera will turn itself off automatically after two minutes by default. 
But what I do every single time I pick up the camera to shoot, I flip this switch, the power switch, right on the shutter button to power it on. I take my picture, and then when I'm done, I just flip it off. And after you do that a few times, it becomes memory, like putting on your seatbelt when you get in a car. You'll just be constantly turning the camera on and off, and I promise that will do a lot to extend the battery life of your camera. Let's talk about fitting the lens. You can see I already have my lens attached. You'll pull it out of the box, and there'll be caps on both the uh, body end of the lens and the lens end of the body. So you'll take those off. They just twist right off. When you go to attach the lens, you'll look for the orange dot on the lens, and you'll match it up to the orange dot on the body. So I'll put those two together, and then I will twist the lens clockwise until it clicks, and then I wiggle it a little bit to make sure that it's on there nice and solid. This is probably the kit lens that you got, the 18-55. to Notice that mine has a hood attached. The hood screws on here. What you'll do is you'll look for the white dot on the hood and the white marking on the lens. You'll line those up, slide it on, and then again you'll twist it. Oh, you'll twist it counterclockwise. And that should stay on just fine. What the hood does is it blocks some stray light that might be coming in at a steep angle without getting in the way of your picture. So that stray light can cause flaring, which is just random lights. It can also uh, improve the contrast of your photos. So generally, having this hood on is a good idea. Um, it will also protect your, you from like physical damage because sometimes you'll have the camera on a strap and you'll be walking around and the lens will, like bang into a wall or something. It's a great shield. I, I try to keep the hood on all the time whenever I can. There are a couple of switches on the lens. We'll go over in detail how to change the aperture and things like that. But for now, I just want you to know the best defaults are to set this OIS switch over to on, and then this other switch, you'll just move it right up to A. So OIS will help cancel out some of your handshake, it's optical image stabilization, and the A up here just means the camera is setting the aperture automatically rather than manually. And again, I'm gonna show you how to do it manually in just a minute, we're definitely getting to that. We're almost done with the physical part of the camera. There are another couple of uh, openings here on the, on the left side of the camera, on the ports. So we'll flip that up again, and I already showed you where the USB port was. You can use that for charging, as I mentioned. You can also use it to transfer images from your camera. But if you run a USB cable from your computer to your camera, you can transfer images into Lightroom or something like that. But I recommend using the memory card reader that's probably built into your computer and just taking out your SD card and inserting it into the memory card reader. It will probably be way faster and Generally, I find it just more convenient than trying to keep this camera plugged into a USB connector. Right above that, you see a micro HDMI port right in the middle there. The HDMI port is basically the same type of connector that you have on the back of your TV. So you could run a micro HDMI to HDMI cable from this to your TV and then put on a slideshow or something. It'll mirror what you see on the back of the screen. Most people don't do this nowadays. Nowadays, if you want to show your pictures off, either you throw them on social media, or you might just hand the camera around and have people look at the back of the camera. But that option exists. You, you could theoretically hook it up to a field monitor. If you're a video guy, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, don't worry about it. The top port here is a microphone jack. And that microphone jack will allow you to hook up an external microphone and uh, bring in some external sound if you're recording video. Notice that it doesn't have a headphone jack built in, so you can't monitor the sound, but you can input an external microphone. Let's talk about actually taking a picture. First, you're going to turn the camera on. You're going to flip that switch from off to on. Now, you can either use the back of the camera like you would a smart smartphone. If you're under 30, you probably will automatically hold the camera out like this. Or you can use the electronic viewfinder up here and hold it to your eye. By default, the camera will automatically determine which of these that you're doing. If you hold it up to your eye, it'll, it'll show the display in the viewfinder. When you're ready to take the picture, you're going to push this button halfway down, and it will focus. See how the green light comes on when I push it halfway down? That means it's finding focus. And when you're happy that it's focused, you'll push it all the way, and it will take the picture. might just take one picture, depending on how you have the camera set up. And that's all pretty easy. I do want to go over a few of the options of actually that you have when actually taking the picture. One is this view mode button here. If you push that, it will switch between the back of the camera, the viewfinder, and automatically detecting which of those is happening. That's important to understand. I, I pretty much prefer to always have it on automatic switching. But sometimes that button will get 
accidentally hit and I'll be like, what, what's it doing? Why is it not switching for me? Just remember where that button is. If it, if it isn't doing what you expect, if the back is staying on, even though you hold your eye up, just press it again until it goes back to fully automatic mode. Um, that setting can also be useful if, for example, you're in a concert and the back display is so bright that it's disturbing everybody around you, put it on viewfinder only. That way you can always hold it up to your eye, but you won't actually be disturbing everybody in the area. You can configure what information you see either in the viewfinder or on the back of the camera. Hit the disp back button here in the lower right corner of the camera. Hit it multiple times and it'll iterate through multiple different configurations. Here we have a configuration that shows you the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO, your kind of key settings. If you push it again, it will hide that information and allow you to really focus on the composition of the picture without any sort of distractions. That's probably how I usually shoot. If you hit it again, it'll actually show you a histogram here. The histogram tells you the brightness of the image and it's the best way to know if you're nailing the exposure. You could just kind of assess the brightness of the screen here, but that's going to depend largely on the ambient light in the area and the actual brightness of the LCD. So it's not that reliable. The histogram is much more reliable. And if you haven't used a histogram before, check out chapter four of my book, Stunning Digital Photography right there, the number one photography book in the world. And I'll walk you through all sorts of things like exposure and using histograms. This camera has a touchscreen, a new thing for Fuji. The touchscreen can be used in a couple of different ways, especially when taking your pictures. By default, it comes with a uh, touch to shoot enabled. So if you look here on the screen, see the little finger and it says shoot. I just did it accidentally. <laughs> that means anytime you touch the screen, it's going to take a picture. By default, it'll try to focus wherever you're touching, but it doesn't move the focusing point around. So you can just touch the screen and take a picture. If you don't like that, if you want to use your finger to change the focusing point, but not automatically take a picture, you can just touch that little icon there. And now I see it says touch AF. So now wherever I touch, it's moving the focusing point. And if I want to take a picture, I have to actually go up to the shutter, push it again, and you can turn the touch screen off entirely. Some people are very concerned that their face or nose are going to brush against the screen when they go to use it. That's never been a problem for me. Um, so I pretty much always just leave it on either touch AF or touch the shoot. Now that we've taken a picture, I'm going to show you how to review the picture. By default, it will review the picture for you automatically, but you can manually hit the play button over here in the upper left corner of the camera. Turn the camera on, hit the play button. And we can see my work of art <laughs> pictures that I took in the studio. Now with a picture displayed, you can easily zoom in by pinching and pulling. There's some soccer pictures that I took the other day pulling in all the way and then panning around with your finger. You can also flip through multiple pictures using the touch interface. If you don't like using touch, you can also use the directional pad back here to quickly flip through things and then use the, uh, the dial on the back to zoom in and pan around. And of course, you can just freely mix and match those two things. You can hit the disc button back here to change the settings that you see while reviewing the picture. And they're going to look a lot like the uh, interface that you saw when you were taking a picture with live view. So here we can see the histogram. If I push it again, it will show me the settings here or blank everything out so I can focus on the composition. Notice that when I get to this particular screen, you'll see this picture now has zero stars. I can push the up Pad, up arrow on the directional pad here to set up to five stars, anywhere from one to five stars. That's really useful when you're shooting and you are flipping through your pictures and you find that one picture that's awesome. And like with the soccer game, I might have taken 200 pictures that day. When I get back to my computer and import them, it's going to be hard for me to find that one picture. So what I can do is set that picture to five stars. And then when I look in Lightroom, I'll see that that picture still has five stars. It'll be easy for me to find it. Auto is really important on this camera. We're going to be going over a lot of complex settings and especially if you're new to photography, it's easy to get freaked out. If you get freaked out or you're handing the camera to somebody else who isn't familiar with everything, there's a switch right here. See it? Flip it down to auto, auto right there. And then when you're ready to be a master again, flip it back up here. So again, if you're ever getting nervous, if you're feeling in over your head, if it's an important moment and you think you might have the shutter speed all wrong and it's going to screw stuff up, you think the camera might think 
better than you. Flip it down to auto. Another button that you should be familiar with is the Q button. This is back here, right above the directional pad. You can push that and it will give you a shortcut to really common settings. So if you're thinking, oh my God, I don't remember how to change the ISO or something else, hit the Q button and then you can pretty much just tab right over to it and change it by using the main dial here. I'll show you specific settings as we go, but I just wanted to give you a high level overview of where that was. Once again, remember to always turn the camera off when you're done shooting and then back on and that's going to do a lot to extend your battery life and give you fewer headaches. What you should do now is go to Google and search for XT20 firmware. Hopefully that will take you to the Fujifilm official website where you can download the latest firmware for this camera. When I'm recording this, there is no firmware update. It's still in the original firmware for the camera, but Fuji does a great thing. They regularly release software updates for their cameras to add new features and to fix problems that come up. So those it really improve your photography and it's made a drastic difference in previous generations of cameras. So I just want to say, I can't, it doesn't exist yet, but you should go look and see if there's a firmware update. It can help you out a lot. Let's talk about the diopter. The diopter is like a glasses prescription that's built into the electronic viewfinder up here. You can see the switch located to the left of the viewfinder it just dials up and down and you can even see it kind of moving the optical elements in there. What you should do to set the diopter, no matter how good or bad your vision is, is hold the viewfinder up to your eye, if your glasses where you can take your glasses off, and then move that switch until the numbers at the bottom of the display look nice and sharp. Don't look at what, where you might be focused. Don't look in the actual viewfinder, but look at the numbers at the bottom and make sure they're nice and sharp. If you ever hold up the camera and it seems like ugh, the camera just won't focus, it thinks it's focused, but it's, everything's all blurry, it's probably the diopter here because it can get hit accidentally and completely screw up how you're using the viewfinder. So go back and reset that. There are a lot of ways you can customize the display on this beyond just hitting that disc button and iterating through a few different options. So I want to show this to you now so you can really get it set up to your specific preferences. Hit the menu button and then we're going to go down to the wrench icon here on the left. And then we'll scroll right over to screen setup and then we'll scroll right again. And here you can see a bunch of different settings that all relate to how you use the rear display and the electronic viewfinder up here. So some of these are important. EVF brightness is set to auto and that's usually going to be fine. But if you're in a really dark environment like a concert or a theater, you could go into manual there and set it lower. Some people with sensitive eyes just like it to be dimmer too. You can also change the color in the viewfinder to your preferences by selecting the second option there. And again, you'll have to hold it up to your eye and then adjust it up and down, but you can make the EVF warmer or cooler depending on how you want it. That's not going to change your pictures. It just changes how the viewfinder displays. So you can really customize it so it looks perfect. Whenever it says EVF, it's referring to this, the electronic viewfinder. When it says LCD, it's referring to the screen on the back. The same options exist here, the brightness and color, but again, the defaults are generally fine and you don't have to worry about it. Image display refers to how long it shows you a picture after you've taken it, like an automatic review. When it does that, it's going to uh, burn a little bit more batteries. It can also slow down your picture taking process. So I always have the image display set to off. It's especially important for sports where you're kind of shooting continuously and then you need to immediately see what's going on and not spend some time chimping. I have it set to off, whereas on a DSLR, I might automatically review my images. It's off on this because you already have seen exactly what you're going to get because the viewfinders, both of them, show you the exact image that you're taking. So you don't have to review your pictures because you already know if it was properly exposed, you already know what the depth of field was like. The next to last option down here, preview exposure slash white balance in manual mode. You can see right now it's set to exposure and white balance, and that's usually what you want it to be. If you're in a studio environment, using strobes or flashes that aren't, well, using any kind of strobe or flash, it would be very confusing because typically the manual settings that you would have dialed into your camera in a studio environment would assume that a whole bunch of light was going to fill the room from the strobes. Therefore, everything would look really dark and that would be impossible to use. So if you're in a studio environment, you need to go in and set this to off. If you don't plan to shoot in a studio, don't worry about it. 
the default of preview exposure and white balance is just fine. Pre preview picture effect on is very cool. And I, I leave this on all the time. What this does is if you set the camera to take pictures in black and white, for example, it will show you a black and white image in the viewfinder and on the back screen. And I love that because that forces me to think in black and white and it allows me to see the world and interact with the world in black and white. So the images that I'm previewing are closer to the image that is, images that I'm actually going to publish. Another great thing you can do is to shoot in RAW, which I'll discuss in a little bit. When you shoot in RAW, it will show you the black and white image or whatever setting you have, but store the original image. So when you get back to your computer, you can always revert back to the full color image and you haven't lost any data. It's one of my favorite things about working with an electronic viewfinder. There's also an option here for framing guidelines. The grid nine is traditional for the rule of following the rule of thirds, a common compositional technique that I cover in chapter two of stunning digital photography. Other than that, you don't necessarily have to worry about it. The next last option here, focus scale units. By default, it's set to meters. Here in the US, we tend to use feet, so I'll change that to feet. And then the last option there, display custom setting. The defaults are generally okay, but you can select this and go in and change these options to be very specific to what you want. So for me, for example, the framing guideline here would allow you to overlay like a rule of thirds guideline. I like to have an electronic level on. I don't care about the focus frame, so I turn that off. I don't so much care about the distance indicators. I don't find that to be that useful, but I do like to always see a histogram, even in the other display mode. So I will turn the histogram on. I do like to see the aperture shutter speed in ISO, even though I generally prefer to look at the lens and the dial up there. It can be helpful to have it on. Photometry is their metering mode and I always use automatic metering. So I, I turn that off. Or I use, always use the default photometry mode. So I turn that off. I almost never use flash on this camera. So I'll turn that off. You get the idea. You can flip through a lot of different options here and decide which of these are important to you and which of these you can simply just hide. I'm happy with those, so I'll go back and continue to work with those. I just wanted to show you how to customize it to your specific needs. So let's get into the actual different shooting modes of the camera, starting with aperture priority. First, a quick discussion on what aperture is. Aperture is the size of the opening in the lens in here. And when it's nice and big, it will let in a whole lot of light. That's referred to as a low f-stop number. It seems backwards. A number like f2 has a really big opening, while a number like f32 has a really small opening. And if you're a math person, it can make a little more sense because if you look at these numbers down here, see how it's written like f slash 32? You can think of it as a fraction. So like this is 1 32nd and that might be 1 over 2. Maybe that helps you, maybe it doesn't. Um, besides letting in more or less light, just like the iris of your eye, the, the pupil of your eye, it also changes how the background is rendered in a picture. So in the left there, you see a picture taken at f1.8 with an 85 millimeter lens, and you can see the background is very blurry. As a photographer, you might want to do this to focus the attention on your subject. That's why it's a common technique for portraiture, because it blurs out any distractions. But as a side effect, it removes a little bit of the story. It tells less about the context in the environment. If you wanted to show more of the environment, you would choose a higher f-stop number like f8. You can see that introduces some of the story. It tells the story of Chelsea being in an alley, the buildings, the cars, the people. You get more sense that she's in an alley in New York City instead of just some random street. And at a high f-stop number like f22, all those details snap into focus. Now you can see exactly where she is. You could read signs. You could tell what make of car it is. But as a portrait, it might not work as well because all those things kind of distract from the subject. Which of those you want is entirely up to you. There's no right or wrong answer. And you can see that you couldn't necessarily trust the camera to make the right choice. That's what's great about being a photographer is making that sort of choice. If you want to know everything about Aperture, visit this URL. It's free. sdp.io slash f-stop where I have a massive video that will go into way more detail and you probably want to know. I'll show you how to set it on this camera. Now, First, I'm talking about aperture priority because almost every camera on the planet uses this system where you're in aperture priority mode or shutter priority mode. 
And if you read SDP here, my book, you will see that I refer to these different modes and recommend you using these different modes. So that's why you kind of have to know what they are, but these modes don't exist per se on the camera in the same way that they do on other cameras. To control your aperture here, you can see the f-stop is written down here. The easiest thing to do is to move this dial on the lens. But first you have to take it out of auto mode. So this switch here, right now it's on A, switch it over to the little picture of an aperture here. Now as we look at the bottom of the, dis at the display here, I'll make it bigger. We can see right now it's set to f32. If I twist this lens to the right, we can see that f-stop number is increasing. That's going to be adding depth of field. And if I scroll it to the left, you can see it's decreasing, letting in more light, but giving me shallower depth of field. Different lenses have the aperture implemented a little bit differently. If I put on this compact and fairly brilliant 27 millimeter f2.8 lens, put it on here, you can see that it doesn't have any markings at all on it. It doesn't have a specific aperture dial. Instead, it just has this focusing dial. What you'll do then is use the front dial here to change your aperture. So you can see I'm moving this dial right here. And as I'm doing that, it's changing the f-stop for me. Other lenses <laughs> are implemented again slightly differently. Let's look at the 16 to 55 f2.8, like their heavy grade super sharp pro lens. So I'll line those orange dots up and click it in place. And you can see the aperture ring on this well-used lens, I use it all the time, actually has physical aperture markings on it. If you go all the way to the left here, setting it to A will allow the camera to automatically set the aperture for me, or I can manually dial in a specific aperture. So if you're trying to simulate aperture priority mode, what you'll do is take the aperture ring out of auto mode, however it is that you do that and set it to something specific, whatever it is that you want, to control the depth of field and the amount of light that's coming in. Besides aperture, you might want to control the shutter speed. Most cameras, again, have a shutter priority mode. If you want to implement shutter priority mode on a camera like this, you'll just set the aperture setting on the lens itself to aperture, or you'll move this front dial here to configure the aperture until it goes into auto mode. Switch back to our kit lens. So I'll switch that over to auto here, and then you will manually take control of the shutter speed by using the shutter speed dial on the top of the camera. So you can see it's physically marked, so I can pick whatever shutter speed I want. Let's try 1 60th of a second. That's a good shutter speed for general kind of shooting and casual portraits. Now, if you don't want to use this dial for the shutter speed, you can also use the dial on the back of the camera here to dial it up or down within a little bit of a range, because you can see the shutter speed dial is marked in full stops, a doubling or a halving of the shutter speed. So it goes right from 60th to 1 125th, while well, 1 80th is a sync speed that's marked with an X there, so that's an exception, but then up to 1 250th, 1 500th. If you wanted to be somewhere in between, like 1 400th, you would pick the closest shutter speed here and then fine tune it with the back dial. So you can see it kind of limits how far off you can get with that. Now I'll say you don't necessarily have to adjust your shutter speed up or down in one-third increments like that. Usually if you're within a stop or so, if you're at the closest stop, it's usually okay. So I wouldn't sweat that too much. I, with these cameras, I just set the shutter speed to whatever I think is closest here, and that's generally fine. If you get freaked out and you don't know what shutter speed to pick, again, just set the shutter speed dial to A or flip this over to auto. If you want to know everything about shutter speed, visit sdp.io slash shutter for a free in-depth video where I cover way more than you want to know about it. Here's a quick overview. Three pictures of my daughter taken at different shutter speeds so you can see how it changes the storytelling. On the left, you have my daughter Madeline there, and you can see the background is whizzing past her. You can see clearly that she's moving. We're both on a merry-go-round. I'm sitting opposite her, so me with my camera, are moving at the same pace. That's why she's not blurry, but the background is. That was taken at one eighth of a second. The shutter is open for a full eighth of a second, and that gives some time for us to actually move while the shutter stays open, creating that panning effect and telling the story of the movement. At one thirtieth of a second, you can see that story changes. There, the background isn't blurred nearly as much. So you get some sense of the motion, but you also have more of a sense for what's actually in the background. 
and at 1 125th of a second, you can see the background is completely frozen. You would not know that we were moving. Shutter speed can be complex, and choosing the right shutter speed isn't always obvious. Slower shutter speeds tell the story of motion and movement, while higher shutter speeds tend to give you sharper pictures. And in, in practice, you want to pick the slowest shutter speed possible without blurring your pictures, but again, stp.io slash shutter for a full and complete overview. Let's talk about implementing manual mode. Again, other cameras will have a big dial where you put it in manual. This camera, you go into manual mode simply by manually choosing your shutter speed and your aperture. And turn the aperture over to the aperture dial here. And now I'm manually setting my shutter speed and aperture, and basically that is what manual mode is. If you want a complete tutorial on how to manually choose the right shutter speed and aperture, visit stp.io slash go manual here. One time when you'll definitely want to use manual mode is when you're shooting in the studio with strobes. You'll want to specifically control your aperture, shutter speed, and your ISO as well. On this camera, you'll want to set the sync speed to 1 1 60th of a second, 1 1 80th of a second. You can see it with the X on the shutter speed dial there. You will set the ISO to the lowest ISO possible. You can set the ISO by hitting the Q button here, scrolling over to the ISO, the second one here, and then dialing it in to either L100 or ISO 200. If you aren't sure which you should use, you could probably go ahead and use L100 and you'd be good. Now for the shutter speed, or for the aperture, you're going to dial the aperture up or down to get the right exposure that you need in the studio environment or to control the depth of field as needed. I just discussed changing the ISO a little bit. I jumped ahead a little bit. The ISO controls the, your camera's sensitivity to light. A high ISO, like ISO 3200, allows you to take pictures in a really dim environment, whereas a low ISO, ISO 200 or ISO 100 on this camera, gathers a ton of light, producing silky smooth and clean images. The high ISOs introduce a lot of noise, a little like red and green speckles that you'll see in the background over there, and they kind of make the picture ugly. So you should avoid high ISOs when you can, but if you're shooting in low light, you won't have any choice, and you'll just have to use those higher ISOs. If you want to know everything about ISO, visit sdp.io slash ISO. And just for thoroughness, I'm going to show you how to change that ISO again. Hit the Q button, scroll to the second option here, and then scroll up or down with the dial on the back. Now, a few things worth noting. You can manually select your ISO all the way up to ISO 51,200. If you scroll past that, you'll get into the auto ISO mode. So see how it says ISO auto 3200? That means the camera will automatically set the ISO and go up to ISO 3200. That's what, I will leave it in ISO auto 3200 almost all the time. I pretty much change it only if I have to manually set the exposure, which is in a studio or perhaps doing night photography. So ISO auto 3200 is where you probably want to be at all times. The ISO 100 setting here also warrant some discussion. See how it's marked L100? That means it's not a true ISO, it's an extended ISO. A true ISO is an ISO that the sensor operates at natively. An extended ISO like ISO 100 actually overexposes internally. It takes a picture at ISO 200 but overexposes it by a stop. When you get it back on your computer or when you look at it on the back of the screen, it will dial the exposure back in software after it's captured it. The net result of that is that it loses a little bit of dynamic range that would be hidden in the brightest parts of the picture. And that's totally fine. If you don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about dynamic range, then you wouldn't ever notice that difference and you could just continue to use ISO 100 as a particularly clean ISO with less noise and a slower shutter speed for times that you want a slower shutter speed. So don't be shy about using the low ISO 100 unless you're like super serious about your raw editing. Exposure compensation is really useful. As I said, for the most part, even when I'm dialing in manual shutter speed and aperture, I'm still using an automatic ISO and that allows the camera to automatically correct the exposure for me. Auto exposure will just look at the scene and figure out how bright or dark stuff should be and make the decision for you. And most of the time, it's just fine. It does a great job of, of exposure compensation. Um, but sometimes, it'll make a scene a little bit too dark. So you can see, well, let me put, get this 
aperture down to a more reasonable level. You can see as I'm looking at my monitor here, look at the histogram in the lower right corner, and you can see that it's not using the full histogram. This screen should be bright white, but that histogram is spiking about two-thirds of the way into the histogram, which means the whole scene is a little bit underexposed. There's no pure white in the scene, but there should be. Now, me as a human, I know that I want that to be bright white in the picture and not middle gray. So what I can do is use exposure compensation to tell the camera that it should be brighter. There's a physical exposure compensation dial on the top of this camera here. That's this thing with the zeros and the minus ones and the plus ones. So you can just twist that, and I'll twist it all the way up to plus one. You don't have to have the camera on. You can just twist it any time that you want. And when it's at plus one, now you can see the screen's a little bit brighter. This histogram shows that by moving the bar a little bit farther to the right. If I keep twisting that to the right, you'll see the screen gets brighter and brighter and brighter. If I go all the way to the left, it'll get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. So you can preview the exposure as you look at it and adjust the exposure compensation dial just until everything looks good. Again, checking that histogram is really helpful. But for the most part, even with the camera up to your eye, just dial that up or down until everything looks good to your eye. But after you've taken your picture, I suggest you grab that dial and set it back to zero. Otherwise, the next time you go to take a picture in a different environment, it's going to be too bright or too dark because it's still applying that exposure compensation, so it won't automatically reset it for you. For detailed information about how to use exposure compensation, visit sdp.io slash ec, that link there at the bottom of the screen. Bracketing. Bracketing is a technique that instructs the camera to take three pictures, one that's at its auto exposure setting, one that's underexposed, darker, and one that's overexposed or brighter. In the film world, we use bracketing a lot to make sure that we got one picture that was properly exposed because <laughs> it was a, uh, um, we, we wouldn't know if we properly exposed it until we got back to the, the lab and actually processed our film. Nowadays, you can see before you even take the picture whether it's properly exposed. So bracketing isn't as useful. However, bracketing is still a good technique if you want to blend your pictures using HDR techniques, high dynamic resolution techniques. If you don't know what HDR is, it's an important technique for serious photographers. Check chapter 11 in my book, Stunning Digital Photography, for detailed information. For now, I'll just show you how to turn bracketing on. If you don't know what it is, then don't even sweat it. There are options on the mode dial here for BKT1 and BKT2. These both turn on bracketing. That's what BKT1 is. That's what BKT stands for. So as we select those, we're selecting between those two different modes. Most of the time, you're going to be using BKT1. So when I turn that on and I go to take a picture, I pushed it once, but it took three pictures consecutively. As I review those three pictures, you'll see that they're each at slightly different exposures. You can see this one's at minus one-third of a stop. This one's at plus one-third of a stop. And the first picture it took is at zero, so the automatic exposure. So it bracketed at one-third of a stop, plus or minus. As I flip through those pictures, you're probably not seeing a huge difference between them because one-third of a stop is almost nothing. <laughs> like most people wouldn't notice if the exposure was missed by one-third of a stop. So for that reason, you might want to go in and change the default setting and have it bracket at a wider margin. So let's go into the menu system and do that now. To change that, you hit the menu button, go to the camera icon here, and then inexplicably, you'll select drive setting. <laughs> I know that's a weird option for it to be hidden in. But under there, you'll see BKT1 setting. So I'm going to scroll to the right here. And now I can set this to the first option, BKT select, and make sure this is set to AE bracket. These other options are things you'll probably never use. And then go down to AE bracket. So now that we've selected AE bracket as the first option, we can tell it how much auto exposure bracketing to select. So I'll select that second option by scrolling to the right. And then for my purposes, I always use plus or minus two. So I'll select that there. And now I can go back, and if I take a picture now, it rattles off three pictures at two stops difference. So quite underexposed, quite overexposed, and then properly exposed according to the camera's auto exposure system. You can repeat that same process and set BKT2 to something different other than what is like white balance bracketing. You can set it to whatever you actually prefer to use for bracketing purposes. This camera also has a bulb mode. Now, by default, if you 
Look at this shutter speed dial here. It goes from one four thousandths of a second down to one second. There are lots of times when you want to do an exposure longer than one second. For example, if you're doing night photography, you might need to shoot for five or ten seconds, especially out in the woods. To do that, you'll click this over one more time all the way to T mode. And now that you're in T mode, you can use the back dial to set the shutter speed to something higher. So as I'm scrolling to the left here, you can see now it's putting a quote mark after it. 10 quote means 10 seconds. If I scroll to the right and I go to just 10, then now I'm at 1 tenth of a second. That's the difference between it. So if you're going into long exposure, you want to look for that little quote. If I keep going to the left, I can go all the way to 30 seconds. So to summarize, from 1 second to 1 four thousandths of a second, your faster shutter speed, you can just use this dial here. Or if you want to go all the way up to 30 seconds, you can select T. T also lets you select any shutter speed, even faster shutter speeds, but I generally prefer to use the dial for, to set the faster shutter speeds. If you want to go for over 30 seconds, you would then have to use bulb mode, which is marked by a B on the shutter speed dial. In bulb mode, I can hold the shutter button down, and as long as I hold it down, it's going to lock the shutter open. So you can see on the back of the display, it's showing a countdown for how long I've had the shutter open. This way you could do a 10 minute exposure if you want to. All you have to do is stand there with your finger on the shutter button holding it down. Of course, you'd want to be on a tripod because it's probably going to be really shaky. Um, you probably don't want to stand there with your finger on the shutter like that. That would get boring. What you can do is you can use any type of threaded shutter release with a locking mechanism on it. It's cool that Fuji gives you this like 100 year old <laughs> shutter locking technology. You can literally screw in a shutter lock mechanism from like the early 1900s and lock the shutter open. Or you can get a remote shutter timer for designed for this particular camera, the XC20, and plug it into the microphone jack here that also works as a remote. When you're done with bulb mode, be sure to take it out a bulb mode and either set it back to automatic or whatever shutter speed you might want to use. For an interesting trick on how to avoid having to use bulb mode and getting a remote shutter trigger using a software trick to blend multiple images, visit sdp.io slash filter where I'll show you how to use free software to combine them together. Okay, photography is not about learning the buttons and dials on your camera. That can be part of it. That's one obstacle. Photography is an art form. Mood, expression, posing, lighting, timing, planning, those things are way more important to photography than just figuring out what the buttons to push. It'd be like if you put somebody in a car and told them what the gas and the brake and the steering wheel did and then set them loose on the streets. Of course, there's some savvy, some technique that you have to learn. I teach all that in my book, Stunning Digital Photography. Not the driving stuff, just the photography stuff. Check it out. It has 14 hours of video included in it, high quality video for free with the book. Every chapter has practices that you can do, quizzes that you can take to make sure you've learned everything, and maybe best of all, it comes with access to a free Facebook group with over 25,000 other motivated learners, open, helpful people who can look at your pictures, help solve your problem. I promise it's the nicest group of people and they're all also in the learning phase, so nobody's going to feel intimidated or dumb there. Go to Amazon and at least look at the reviews for Stunning Digital Photography. It's the number one photography book in the world. People really like it. You can buy it directly from Amazon or you can buy it directly from us. We ship worldwide at sdp.io slash store. The ebook with all the videos and everything else built into it is less than 10 bucks. If you get the paperback book, it's closer to like 20 bucks. If you get into photo editing, I have books on Adobe Lightroom and Adobe Photoshop. And then I also have a book on buying gear, figuring out what all these lenses are, figuring out what things like focus breathing are and, and which types of flashes you should use, what light modifiers you should get for your flashes, beauty dishes, soft boxes, all that is covered in my photography buying guide. Check it out here. Thanks for waiting through my plug. <laughs> if you want some detailed information on how to do night photography, this is a free video, just YouTube, sdp.io slash NP. Free landscape photography information, sdp.io slash LS, and free wildlife information, sdp.io slash WL. Now let's go through the shutter modes on the camera. The shutter dial is up here in the upper left corner of it. You can see when you get it, it's probably set to S, which is single shutter. With single shutter, I can hold the button down and it will take one picture. Even if I keep holding it down, it's only going to take one picture. If I set it to CL, 
That means continuous low. If I do continuous low, it will take continuous pictures at a low speed. That's what that stands for. That's good for times when, I don't know, not sports, but maybe portraiture. CH here, the next one, is continuous high, right? Now when I hold it down, it's going to shoot much faster. That's the mode you want to be in for, for sports. So that's kind of how I use it. I'll use CL when I'm taking pictures of people, because it's always useful to rattle off a couple of pictures. And if you have that little extra beat between frames, then that means that people's expressions will change. If they're blinking in one picture, they won't be blinking in the second picture. It never hurts to grab three or four frames of somebody, and then later you can go back and pick the best one. After all, it's not film. It doesn't cost you anything, right? That's the basics of shutter modes. There's also a silent shutter on this camera, which is terribly, terribly useful. If you want to turn on the silent shutter, hit the menu button, go to the camera icon here, and then scroll down to shutter type. You can see right now it says MS, that stands for mechanical shutter. Mechanical, like there's a physical shutter that comes down, it's like clunk clunk, that's what that sound is. You can go down to electronic shutter. Electronic shutter, you'll notice at the bottom here, also allows for higher shutter speeds going all the way up to 1 32 thousandths of a second. So I'll select the electronic shutter, and now when I go to take a picture, okay, it's still making a sound, which is weird. I'll show you how to turn that off now. now. Now it's not a mechanical sound, but it's actually playing a sound through the speaker. So to next turn that off, you'll hit the menu button, you'll go down to the wrench icon, the second option down is sound setup. You'll scroll to the right and go down to shutter sound, no, go to shutter volume and set that to off. Great. So now we have it's taking pictures, but it's not making any sound. And that is such an amazing feature. I know it sounds creepy, like you're being a creep, but you're not. Just imagine that you're taking pictures at your, your nephew's wedding, and you don't want to be on the third row, like clunk, 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 while they're taking their vows. Now you can take pictures without disturbing anybody. It's also like for street photography. It's a very easy way to take, take discrete pictures. You can flip this screen out here, and then kind of hold it at waist level and snap a few pictures and nobody will think twice about it. I tend to use the silent shutter all the time. Even when I'm shooting sports, I'll use the silent shutter uh, just so um, I'm not disturbing the other parents on the sideline. I just, I'm a guy who'd rather blend into the background than call attention to myself. And for that reason, I really love the silent shutter. While I'm here, I want to show you how to select those higher shutter speeds that the silent shutter, the electronic shutter, enables for you. So to do that, you'll set the dial up here to 1 4 thousandths, the top shutter speed, and then you can use the back dial to increase the shutter speed. Let's make that bigger. So now I'm at 1 8 thousandths and I can keep going all the way up to 1 32 thousandths of a second. Now, it's going to be tough to get a decent exposure at 1 32 thousandths of a second because you can see the screen's completely black now. That means the camera can't gather enough light in that really short period of time to properly expose your picture. So the only time you're probably going to be using 1 32 thousandths of a second is if you've specifically set up like big strobes and you're taking a picture of, I don't know, a bullet popping a balloon or something like that. But anyway, that's how you do it. Let's talk about the self timer. Self timers are useful if you put the camera on a tripod and you want to like run around and put your arm behind your family and join in a picture. To turn on the self timer, hit the Q button and then scroll down to the lower left option here. You can see it looks like a little clock, kind of. And then you're going to use this back dial to set it to either 2 seconds or 10 seconds. 2 seconds is good for when you have the camera on a tripod and you want to eliminate shutter shake, the shake of the camera by pushing the shutter. 2 seconds means it'll fire 2 seconds later after the shake has dissipated. Great for night photography, macro photography. 10 seconds is good for those selfies. So when I have that enabled, I'll push the button. You can see this light comes on and it's kind of telling people that it's getting ready to take a picture. And then it starts the countdown. It's beeping, communicating that it's about to take a picture. And that's the point when kind of everybody smiles and gathers around. When you're done, go back and set that to off because otherwise it's going to be really annoying the next time you go to quickly take a picture and it's waiting <laughs> 10 seconds for you. It also has an interval timer. 
which can allow you to take pictures over a period of time, like one picture every second or one picture every 10 minutes. You can use that to create time lapses or just to make sure that you capture a moment. Like you just put the camera out and have it photograph for the next hour and then pick the most interesting frame from all those uh, pictures. To set up the interval timer, you'll hit the menu button, go down to the camera icon, and then on the first page, about four down, you'll see interval timer shooting. Scroll to the right there, and now we're going to set the interval and the number of shots. So you can see right now by default it's set to zero hours, one minute, and zero seconds. So let's scroll to the right and set that to zero minutes and one second. So now the fastest possible interval we can do is one every second. And now we can set it to infinite where it'll just keep taking pictures until you turn it off, or we can make it take a specific number of pictures. But for our purposes, let's just set it to infinite. So I'll select that. And now you can set the waiting time, how long you want it to wait until it starts taking pictures. So if you, you could have it, you could set the camera up before sunset, have it start taking pictures an hour before the sun was actually setting and keep taking pictures for a couple of hours until after the sun was set if you wanted to do a time lapse of the sun setting. Or if you want to take pictures right away, just make sure that's set to zero. You can see the estimated start time here at the bottom of the screen, 219. So I'll just click OK and right away, it's at the silent shutter, so you're not hearing it, but it is taking pictures and it's showing a countdown for every frame. It's an absolutely great implementation of the interval timer. Now later, there's lots of different apps that will take all your pictures and combine them into a time-lapse video. If that's what you want, you can even do it directly from Lightroom. I'll show you how in my Lightroom book. Let's talk about the different focusing modes on the camera. By default, when you get the camera, it's going to be set up to single shot. So, when you push the shutter button halfway, it will focus and then stop trying to focus. So you can see I focused on the screen and then I moved away and it didn't try to refocus on the rest of the studio. If I focus on the studio and then move, it's not going to refocus for me. That's what single shot is. Single shot focusing is precise, but you can't track any sort of action with it. If you want to track action, you should switch to continuous focusing. There's a dial on the front of the camera here. You can see right now it's set to S, which is single focusing. C is continuous focusing, which you'd use for sports. And then M is manual focusing. On this camera, S is the best for sort of standard focusing. It's the most accurate. It's the most reliable. C can get a little unreliable. If you take a bunch of pictures in continuous mode of a still subject, a couple will be in focus and a couple are going to be out of focus. So use S whenever you can. If you're getting serious and you want to manually focus, <laughs> switch it over to M, and then you'll grab the focusing ring on your lens. It's in a different place in every lens. If, if you have this 27 millimeter pancake lens, this is the focusing ring. There's no aperture ring. It's just that focusing ring. For detailed information about when to use the different focusing modes, visit sdp.io slash focus for a free video. You can also choose to configure different types of focusing points, and I'll show you how to do that. Hit the Q button, and then on the bottom row, the second from the, from the left, you'll see this AF selector here. Now I can use the back dial to choose between a single focusing point, which is my favorite, a focusing area where the camera will focus anywhere in a general area, or a wide mode where the camera will look at the entire scene basically and decide where it wants to focus. I, I don't like to leave important decisions like focusing up to the camera. So for me, I'm always on a single autofocus point. I just find that the most useful. So with that said, I can now change the focusing point by pushing down on the directional pad here. That enables the mode where I move the focusing point. So once it's in that mode, I can scroll around and set the focusing point like this. This also allows me to change the focusing point size by using the back dial. So as I scroll to the right, I'll select a bigger focusing point. Bigger focusing points focus faster, but it can be less precise. If you put a big focusing point on somebody's eye and it was like this, it might focus on their eye or it might focus on their forehead or their nose. And depending on the lens you're shooting with, that would be enough to screw it up. So for those situations, you'd want to use a smaller, more precise focusing point. But the smaller the focusing point, the slower focusing will be and the less reliable focusing will be. So this is a conscious choice that you as a photographer have to make whether you want to go for precision and sacrifice reliability or go for reliability and sacrifice precision. 
the default's right there in the middle. And that's probably a good option for general situations. Now, notice that pushing down requires an extra button push before you select the focusing point. That can slow you down a little bit, especially if you're shooting sports and you need to rapidly change that focusing point. A faster method, of course, is to use the touch AF. Push this on the upper right here until it shows touch AF, and then you can select the focusing point just by touching anywhere. Unfortunately, that doesn't work when you have it to your eye, so you'll still have to use the directional pad. However, you can change the setting in the camera so that you don't have to push down first, so that right away when you push on the directional pad, it will change your focusing point. I'll show you how to do that now. Hit the menu button, go to the wrench icon, go to button dial setting, scroll to the right, and then scroll down to selector button setting. It's calling the directional pad the selector button. Naming could be better. By default, it's set to FN button, which means these each have their own unique functions. I don't really need that. I prefer to have it set to focus area. So I'll select that, and now when we're on the screen again, I can change the directional pad without having to push down first. Just saving that one key press makes everything go much easier. It also means that when you have your eye to the viewfinder, you can really quickly change the focusing point and rapidly move it around if you're changing your composition, for example, when you're shooting sports in action. This camera also has face and eye detection where it will look at the scene and try to find faces and focus specifically on people's eyes. It really has the potential to be incredibly useful for portraits by not requiring you to manually select the focusing point in the scene. I found that in practice, at least in the first version of the firmware, the eye detection is less than perfect and in fact can miss focus so much or not find the eye so much that it can be frustrating to use. So for that reason, at this current point in time, I haven't found it useful and I would prefer to just manually set the focusing point. However, uh, I encourage you to experiment with it using your own lenses and whatever the latest firmware is and see if Fuji might have improved it because they do tend to improve these things over time and I'm optimistic that later versions of the software will work better. So I'll show you how to turn it on. Hit the menu button here. Scroll down to AF, MF, which has lots of different focusing settings. And scroll down to the bottom of the first page, face eye detection setting. It's set to off by default. Uh, you know why? Because that it distracts the camera a little bit. Like the camera has to take a little bit of processing time away from whatever it's doing to think about the eye and the face. So it burns a few extra uh, battery jolts or whatever you call it. <laughs> burns some extra juice and slows down other types of processing. So if you are going to go into this, what I would suggest is selecting face on eye auto. That way it will try to find a face and focus on whichever eye it thinks is closest. Hopefully that will work better for you than it has for me. Again, if you aren't using it, it's better to turn it off because it will make the rest of the camera faster and more efficient. Another option I want to tell you about and encourage you not to use it is pre-AF. Pre-AF is also on the AM, AF, MF, page one settings. You'll see it here. What pre-AF does is it causes the camera to continually autofocus even if you aren't holding down the shutter button halfway. You might think, okay, that will lock focus in a little bit quicker because it's anticipating me using it. But what actually happens is anytime you forget to turn the camera off, maybe it's just hanging from the strap, you'll, you'll hear the camera continuously trying to focus on the ground or whatever it's seeing, and it burns through a ton of batteries. I also found that it hasn't made focusing particularly better. So again, just leave that turned off. I'm just being proactive in case you go in and exploring settings. That one can really mess you up. Uh, this option also has, this camera also has a, the option for a couple of different types of focus assist, which can be really useful when uh, manually focusing. Right now, MF assist is set to standard. And when you select standard, what will happen? I'll switch the camera to manual focus. And when I turn the ring here, you can see it is shifting stuff in and out of focus, uh, but the camera isn't really helping out in any way. And that's just kind of the standard. Something you can do to help that is to hit the menu button, scroll down to focus check, and set that to on. So when that's on, watch when I grab this dial here. Oh, wait. As soon as I turn that dial, it pops and zooms in for me and just helps me nail the focus. Now, the picture I take isn't going to be zoomed in. It's zooming in either on the back of the screen or in the viewfinder just to help me focus. 
It can also screw up your competition, especially because the manual focus dial kind of gets hit accidentally. It'll, it's always going to be popped in. So you might not want to use it, but sometimes I use it, sometimes I don't. Another manual focus assist option, I'll select that option, scroll to the right, and then I'll select digital split image in color. And when I do that, you'll see this display that kind of resembles an old timey split prism camera. And what you want to do is get it so that you see where the edge of that is. When those two parts of the image are lined up, then everything should be in focus. And you can see how that A is not lined up there. That means it's out of focus, or you can twist it and try to get it in focus. I, I, I don't like that at all. <laughs> I just don't find that useful. An option that's slightly more useful is focus peak highlight. So I'll select that. And what I usually set it to is red and high. I'll show you what that is. You can see when stuff is kind of in focus, it will be highlighted in red there. So as I pull stuff out of focus, you'll see that red kind of go away. And then as I get it in focus, it's going to highlight the part of the scene that's in focus in red. What it's doing isn't really telling you what's precisely in focus, but what's kind of close to being in focus. So it's not an exact thing. Like you can see red outlining somebody's eye. And so when you get it back on your computer, realize you slightly missed focus. So it's not that exact, but it's better than nothing. It helps you get in the ballpark at least. The more reliable way is to actually use that method, which zooms in. Red works fine in this black and white screen, but if I were taking a picture of a red dress, that wouldn't be useful. So you might instead set it to white or blue. Just make sure you pick a color that's not predominant in the scene if you actually want that to be useful. Set that back to standard and put my camera back to autofocus. You always want to set your camera back to some default setting so that it's ready for the next time you pick it up. AF plus MF mode allows you to grab the manual focusing ring at any time and start manually focusing without having to switch the camera to manual focus mode. If you're accustomed to shooting with a DSLR, most lenses work like that and you might want to recreate that setting. So I'll go over to the AF-MF option here and I'll just scroll down to the second page. AF plus MF, it's turned off by default. I'll turn it on. And now, even though I'm in single focus mode, I can still just grab that focusing ring at any time twist it and change the focusing. The reason you might not want to turn that on is that depending on the lens, the focusing ring can be really easy to turn accidentally. So you might actually be throwing yourself out of focus regularly. So I'll just turn that off. I also want to show you the AF illuminator. If you're in a really dark environment, the camera will turn on this white light here. Completely give away any discretion, notify everybody that you're trying to take a picture, but it will add some light to the scene and make focusing a little bit easier. Um, I hate that, again, because I would rather remain hidden. So I like to turn off the AF Illuminator. This is on the AFMF page, the first page here at the bottom, AF Illuminator. I'll go in and just turn that off. I find it doesn't help that much in low light. The camera usually does pretty good in pretty low light environments anyway. There are a lot of options to tuning the focusing behavior, especially tuning continuous focusing. I'm not going to walk you through every option, but I will show you where they are. Again, I'll hit the menu button here. Going up to the AF-MF section of the menu here, you'll see AFC custom settings. And I'll scroll to the right here. And now you can kind of pick from different continuous focusing settings for different types of sports. And I haven't found that they make, that any of these dramatically improve my sports performance over the default. So I pretty much always leave it at one. However, if you're shooting a specific sports scenario and you think you can get better focusing results, this is where you do it. Go in and select a different focusing system. Now let's talk about the Wi-Fi system. You can use Wi-Fi to transfer pictures wirelessly from your camera to your smartphone. And then from your smartphone, you can stick them on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or whatever. It's great when you're away from a computer, especially if you're traveling and you take a great picture on your camera and you just want to like share it with everybody right away over lunch, whenever you have a couple of minutes of downtime on a tour bus or something, send it over. The first thing you're gonna do is install the Fujifilm camera remote app on your phone. So you go into your app store. It works for iOS and Android. I just happen to be using an iPhone. I'll do search here and look for Fujifilm.
And there it is. See, it's like got that green icon from the monitor here. And um, you might notice the rating. It's got one and a half stars. The lowest rating is one star. So really, it's only earned half a star over the worst possible rating <laughs> it could get. That's a bad rating. You probably don't have a lot of one and a half star apps installed on your phone. Um, and it's because it's not a great app. It's, it leads, if you look at the reviews, there's lots of user frustration. And indeed, it's kind of flaky. But it can work, and it can work reliably. I have used it on vacation and stuff, so I'll open it up, show you how to use this as best as you possibly can. I just wanted to warn you that there might be moments when you're using it when it's a little flaky, it's a little frustrating. Um, so now that we've got this on, it's kind of guiding you through the fact that we need to go to the camera now. So I'm going to go into the camera, hit the menu button on your camera, go to the camera icon, and then on the second page here, the second page of the camera icon, you'll see wireless communication, which is their nerdy way of saying Wi-Fi. So I'll scroll to, the, scroll to the right, and you can see green blinking Wi-Fi says, hey, okay, the camera's now doing Wi-Fi stuff. It has started up its own wireless access point, just like the one in your house. So now with that running, you're going to go back to your phone and connect to this wireless network. Whether you're on uh, iPhone or an Android phone, the Android phone might connect for you automatically after you've done it the first time. So I need to go into my settings, go to Wi-Fi. I'm going to look for the network. Here it is. It's labeled Fujifilm X-T20. You can change that if you want to. It's connecting, connecting. So as it's connecting to my camera here, it's disconnecting from my home Wi-Fi. And it wouldn't use my cellular connection either. So whenever you have that Wi-Fi connection set up, you can't also browse Instagram. So if you're trying to get a picture from your camera to your phone to Instagram, you have to connect to the camera, transfer the picture, and then disconnect from the camera to connect back to the internet and upload the picture. So now these two things are connected. I can pretty much do everything else from my phone. So I'll double tap that so I can get back to the Fuji camera remote. And you can see now it's detected that connection. And it's given me a bunch of different options for things I can do. For getting my pictures, I'll browse the camera. Right now it's downloading a bunch of thumbnails. The camera's working furiously, burning through insane amounts of battery as it tries to do this. <laughs> it does use quite a bit of battery. Um, while I wait patiently. Oh, you know what? The camera says connect OK. I need to click OK here. OK, so now it's going to connect. And now you can see all the recent pictures that I took. So I can scroll back. Let's see, find some of those sports pictures that I took. Okay, well, here's a nice landscape picture that I took. So I can select that and put a little checkbox up there, select, select a couple of different pictures, and now I can click import. You can see it's going to tell me exactly how much size I have, how much space I have left on my camera, and what the download size is. If I wanted to select everything, I could click all up here, but that could be a lot of pictures. So I'll click import, and now it's saved zero of two images. It's downloading the first one. Great. It saved both images. So now what I could do is go right into whatever app I wanted to share from. Uh, go to Instagram. And there you can see the two pictures that I just imported. And uh, now it's just like any picture that I took with my smartphone. While we're here, I want to show you a couple other features of the Wi-Fi app. I'll click exit here to get out of that and get back to the main menu. Um, when you click exit like that, it disconnects the app from the phone. It's a pain. So now that I transfer those pictures, if I want to go into the geotagging or remote control features, I have to go back. I'll hit the menu button. Camera icon, second page, wireless communication to the right. This starts up the wireless access point again. At this point, I have to go back into my Wi-Fi settings and reconnect. If I wasn't at home, if I was out somewhere where there wasn't Wi-Fi, my, my phone would automatically see a new brand new wireless access point that it knew, so it would automatically connect and kind of save you that extra step. So it's easier when it's on the go. Back in the Fujifilm camera remote, you can see a few different options here. One is remote control. Select that, and this gets freaky. Now look, <laughs> now you can see through the lens on the phone, and I can point it back 
touch Justin, it can automatically focus, and I can take a picture. Pretty cool, right? And in fact, you can even change different settings. So go ahead and play with that. You can see I'm changing the aperture. I can adjust the exposure compensation. So that's kind of cool for a remote control. From there, you can also go right into the camera remote and view the pictures that you've previously taken. So let's get back out of there. And once again, it's going to say disconnect. As I go back to the main menu, even though I don't want to disconnect. <laughs> um, now that it's disconnected, once again, I have to turn the camera back on. Menu, camera icon, scroll down to wireless communication, turn it on, select the Wi-Fi network, switch back to the Fujifilm app. I want to show you another option for geotagging. What geotagging will do is take your current location information based on the GPS and tag the pictures in your camera with it. So it will actually use your smartphone's GPS to tag your pictures. And then when you import those pictures into Lightroom or something, they can show up on a map in the Lightroom map module. It's really cool, especially if you're traveling, you can see exactly where you took a picture. If you're a landscape photographer, that's a great way to be able to revisit a spot that you really liked in the future, but maybe you want to shoot it at different times of day, different weather conditions, different seasons, that kind of thing. The last option here is receive. I can touch that. And right now it will just automatically send over any pictures that I send from the back of my camera. So the difference is you're picking pictures on the back of your camera rather than from your phone. I'd rather use my phone, but uh, there's one my daughter there in the background kind of. Uh, I'll select OK to send it over and you can see bang it appears. Just a different way of kind of getting the same thing done. Uh, thanks Fuji for making an app that it's a little frustrating but <laughs> mostly reliable. One of the settings you might want to change in your camera is to switch from shooting JPEG pictures to shooting either raw pictures or raw and JPEG pictures. Here's the difference. JPEG is the most common image format on the web, but it's a highly compressed format so that it doesn't take up as much space as we're cramming it down those inner tubes, right? Raw files are much bigger, but they store a lot more information. JPEG throws away details that are hidden in the brightest and darkest parts of the picture. And you could use those details later to change the brightness of the image on your computer as if in case you screw up the settings on the camera, you can kind of fix it later. Raw files are really great that way. If you want to shoot raw, and I suggest everybody do, especially if you use an app like Lightroom, turn it on by hitting the menu button, going to the camera icon here. No, going to the IQ icon here. And it's the second option down. That's how important it is. It's the very second option on the camera. <laughs> Scroll to the right, and now you can pick either Fine plus Raw or just Raw. If you're going to be using the Wi Fi app, either select Normal and Raw or Fine plus Raw. If you're not using the Wi Fi app, if you're just importing into Lightroom or another Raw processing app, just select Raw. So most of the time, if I'm traveling, I'm in Normal plus Raw because I know sometimes I want to send those JPEGs over. And normal just makes those JPEG files a little bit smaller. If you still don't know why you might shoot raw, visit this URL, sdp.io slash raw vjpeg, where I will show you exactly why it's useful and kind of demonstrate it. If you're working through stunning digital photography, chapter three, I'll discuss different metering modes. For the most part, you can just leave this at the default metering mode. You never have to change it. But in case you do want to try spot metering or something, I'm going to show you how it's done. Um, on Fuji cameras, it's called photometry. Everyone else in the world calls it metering. They call it photometry. To change the photometry, hit the menu button, go to the camera icon, and on the first page, you'll scroll down to photometry. If you can't select photometry, if it's disabled, then it probably means you have the face and eye detection focusing on. It doesn't make any sense why you can't change the photometry with face and eye detection on, but you can't. To change that, go back to AFMF, Go down to face eye detection and set that to face eye detection off. So going back to the photometry, as I select that option, you can select between the different values. And again, I discussed that in the book, but for the most part, the multi, the default is exactly what you need and you never have to worry about it. White balance is another setting you generally don't have to change, but I'm going to show you how, just in case you want to. Again, it's in chapter three of SDP. Hit the Q button. And then the white balance is in the upper right corner here. You can see by default it's set to white balance auto. 
white balance is it's the reason that blue and gold dress look different to different people it's because our brains automatically adjust the white balance that we perceive if we're under like yellow incandescent lights versus blue led lights it will adjust that for us automatically so they all just look white the camera does that too and usually white balance is just fine sometimes it gets it wrong so you might want to go in there and then move this dial on the back to select you know white balance for sun or, or shade or different types of fluorescent lights or incandescent light or underwater but again white balance auto usually works just fine i just wanted to show you where that was Let's talk about recording video this camera has an awesome video camera built into it 4k video works really well if you want to record video you'll take this shutter dial here and go all the way to the video camera the last setting here now what it's doing is it's it's showing you the video display on the back and right now it's looking really dark so let's get that aperture opened up you can see it's cropping the display into 16 by 9 so this is a better preview of what i'm actually going to see it will still focus and everything for the most part it works just like uh, taking stills but now the shutter instead of taking a still image is going to take start recording video so i'll push that and you can see it's recording video with the default settings it will focus continuously if you have it in continuous focus mode so now you can see it's kind of switching focus automatically so choose between single focus or continuous focus depending on your needs otherwise it, it should be pretty self-explanatory i'll push the shutter again to stop the recording by default it's going to record at full hd which is like 1080p uh, it can record at 4k which has four times the resolution it'll produce much higher quality video if you change it to that so i'll show you how to do that now i'll hit the menu button we'll go down to the video camera icon here the first option is movie mode we'll scroll up to 2160 2997 that's basically 30 frames a second this is pretty much what you see on youtube and pretty much everywhere for the most part so that's the option that i usually use you can also select manually select different movie af modes here but multi is generally better that allows you to specify exactly where you want it to focus other options here you probably don't ever need to adjust you can see that there are options for hdmi out you can record to an external field recorder from the micro hdmi port on the, the left side i discussed that earlier uh, you can also adjust the mic level you can select that and see your mic levels here so if it's too quiet you could crank it up if you're peaking if it's getting into the yellow on a regular basis you could turn it down to just kind of get the the perfect mic levels that's what there is to know about video when you're done with that you probably want to set this back to continuous high so that you can take stills instead of accidentally shooting a video at some point you're going to fill up your memory card um, you can reuse it what you should do is take out that memory card put it in your computer up upload all the pictures to your computer and then back those pictures up to a cloud service like dropbox google drive microsoft onedrive because in case your computer fails you'll have that uh, those pictures stored somewhere else at this point now that your pictures are safely in two places you can safely reformat that memory card and use it all over again to format the memory card and clear it out you'll hit the menu button back here go down to the wrench icon select user setting and then the top option here is format so i'll select format and it will prompt me erase all data uh, okay to erase everything or cancel if you actually don't want to do that if you accidentally format your card, all hope is not lost. Visit this URL, sdp.io slash photorec. You can install an app on Windows, Mac OS, or Linux that will scan your formatted memory card, your freshly formatted memory card, and recover pictures and video pretty reliably. Don't pay for an app that does that. This free app does it, and most of those paid apps just use that free app underneath. So look, I saved you some money there, and maybe I saved your butt. Um, if you do accidentally format a memory card don't keep shooting on it take it out put it somewhere safe because if you do start taking pictures those are going to overwrite your hidden pictures on there something i like to do is to turn off the sound from the camera because when it focuses it'll still occasionally beep so to do that i'll hit the menu button i'll go down to the wrench icon i'll go to sound setup scroll to the right and then af beep volume i'll turn that off I generally like the self-timer beep volume though you can turn that off turn off the operation volume the shutter volume 
and the playback volume for video, you might want to leave that on. But with the AF beep volume off, you won't be like beep, 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 beep all the time, which is annoying to the people around you. You still see if it focuses. It's not a concern. You can use back button focus to take complete control of your focusing. Back button focus decouples focusing from the shutter button. So you can push halfway and it will not automatically focus. Instead, when you want to autofocus, you'll have to push one of these buttons on the back here uh, to autofocus. Now, this is terribly useful for night photography, for macro photography, for sports, wildlife, that kind of thing. For a complete discussion of why it's useful, watch this video at sdp.io slash ybb. For now, I'll just show you how to do it. Um, the easiest thing to do on this camera is just to switch the focusing system over to manual focus. Now that you're in manual focus, that means it will not automatically focus when you push the shutter button halfway. But you still can autofocus by pushing the AFL button. So there. That's all you have to do <laughs> to use back button focus is just switch it to manual focus. Um, if you hand your camera to somebody else, they probably won't know how to do that. So just be sure to switch it back to single focus for them. Adapting lenses. Because this is a mirrorless camera, you can put just about any kind of lens ever made on it. And that's really cool. You can get very inexpensive but dumb adapters to fit on your, your grandpa's old Canon FD lenses like the one I have here. These adapters are generally very simple. You can see one side here attaches to your Fuji camera. The other side attaches to just about any lens you can imagine. Uh, Pentax, Minolta, Sony, Canon, whatever. As long as it's an SLR lens, there's plenty of room. So these things cost like 20 bucks. They're really cheap. Now these lenses aren't going to be great. They're not going to be super sharp. Some people think like you can get old good glass, but I haven't ever gotten good results with them. I always prefer to use native lenses. But if you do want to play with adapted lenses, it's fun. I'll line up the dot there with the dot on the body, lock it in there. And then this is a Canon FD lens from a super old, I think it came with an AE-1 Canon camera. And I'll latch that on there. And this particular lens, as manual aperture control, so I'll open that up, then I'll have to focus with that. So now you can see I can focus with it a little too close and adjust the aperture and kind of see the effects in real time and just take pictures with it. Well, it's actually not letting me take pictures at the moment because there's one setting I have to change, which is to enable shutter release without a lens attached. Because the camera doesn't know it has a lens attached right now because it doesn't have an intelligent lens that's communicating and saying what type of lens it is. So to turn that on, I'll hit the menu button. I'll go to the wrench icon. I'll scroll to button dial setting. And then I'll scroll to the right. And you can see the next to last option here is shoot without lens. That's turned off by default. I'll just turn that on. One more thing while we're in the menu system that you should change. Go to the camera icon. Scroll to the right. Scroll down and you'll see mount adapter setting. Select that and set it to the millimeters of the lens. This is a 50 millimeter lens, which happens to be the default. So I'll just leave that at 50. So now that that's set, I can manually focus the lens and then take a picture. Just like there. Uh, so now you're shooting with adapted vintage lenses. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? I also want to show you how to customize some more of the buttons. We covered this a little bit, but the buttons are really kind of almost infinitely customizable. To change those, you'll hit the menu button, go to the wrench icon, scroll to the right, and then under button dial setting, scroll to the right here, here's all the different buttons you can change. So you could switch the two dials so that if shutter speed feels like it should be on the front dial and aperture feels like it should be on the back dial, you could swap that. You could also change what these AEL and AFL buttons do and assign them to do something else. So here you can see you can just scroll through all the different buttons and dials and configure what everything does. So knock yourself out. You can make the focus ring spin backwards if it feels backwards to you. <laughs> Set those up in a way that you feel comfortable. If you're new to photography, I would suggest working with the defaults. Only do that if you grew up using some other camera and you want it to be more similar to this. It can be hard to find your favorite settings buried in those menus. I know I always forget where they are and it takes me a while to find them. A way to make that simpler is to create your own custom menu that has just the items you use most frequently. To set that up, I'll hit the menu button. I'll go down to the wrench icon and then I'll scroll to the right 
and under user setting, I'll scroll down to my menu setting. I'll scroll to the right again, and I'll select add settings. And here I can select from a variety of different menu items that I want to appear. Like maybe I always change noise reduction, I'll select that. So with that option selected, what I can do now is go back to the menu, scroll down to my, and you'll see that option as well as anything else that I added to my menu. What other tips have you discovered with the XT20? I'd love to hear it. Add a comment down below. And if you are reading this, you might want to read through the comments some and see what other tips other people have come up with. Sometimes you don't figure things out or sometimes you just stumble across things after you use the camera for a while. If you're interested in learning more about Fuji as a company, they have a really fascinating history that actually like predates World War II. Uh, visit stp.io slash Fuji history to watch our podcast and learn all about it. If you get into post-processing, uh, check out Adobe Lightroom. I've mentioned it a couple of times, but Adobe ships Lightroom and Photoshop together for a monthly fee called Creative Cloud. And that's not everybody's favorite thing to pay monthly, but Adobe kind of forces you to do it. <laughs> There's not really a better option. So I would visit stp.io slash Adobe deal and sign up for it. In the US, it's 10 bucks a month and you get a 30 day free trial so you can try it out. Now I'm going to go through some accessories that you should get for your camera. Um, don't feel like you have to buy them, but some of these will really make your life better. And one you absolutely need is an extra battery. Because even in the course of recording this, I ran out of videos on this camera and had to go get my extra battery. But if you're out on vacation and imagine you've been shooting all day in this beautiful spot that you're only going to visit once in your life and then halfway through the day, the battery's dead. Uh, that's crushing because you're just going to miss all those pictures. Now, you can hook it up to a USB charger and recharge your battery, but that can be slow. So keep that in mind in emergencies. But do carry an extra battery. Use this link, stp.io slash xt2 battery to pick up a second copy and just carry that with you and be sure to recharge it overnight too. Um, I suggest getting extra memory cards. A uh, 128 gig memory card is not too much. You can get by with a 32 gig card, but especially if you're shooting raw, a bigger card size is going to be uh, convenient because you won't fill it up as frequently. I'd also suggest using this link here, stp.io slash sd, and finding the cheapest possible <laughs> cards you can get, like little 8 gig cards. And uh, sometimes you can get like two for 10 bucks. And buy like four of those. And put one of those in your glove box, put one in your purse, put one in your wallet, put one in your desk at work, wherever. That way, in case you ever leave the house without a memory card or you fill up your memory card, you'll be able to go to that emergency memory card and put it in your camera. I know you don't need that now, but at some point in the future, you're going to run out of space and, or forget your memory card and you're going to be either thinking, Tony told me to get one and I ignored him, or thanks, I'm so glad I listened to Tony for telling me to get those cheap memory cards. It's just cheap insurance, right? You can change the lenses on this camera and Fuji has some really awesome lenses. So I'm going to discuss some of my favorites. My absolute favorite is this Fuji 16 to 55 f2.8. Ooh, it's a big and heavy piece of glass, but it is razor sharp, like professional grade sharp. It gives up nothing to those big Canon and Nikon 24 to 70 f2.8s. It's just a great, great lens. The one thing it's missing is image stabilization. So this kit lens has image stabilization. You can hand hold at slower shutter speeds. You really have to watch the shutter speed on this lens and make sure that you don't go too slow or you could end up with shaky pictures. Um, go back to my shutter speed video and I discuss more how to avoid that. If you want sharp pictures, visit stp.io slash f55 to pick it up. If you want to go super wide angle, which is great for landscapes or for example, shooting tight streets in Europe where you don't have a space to back up, the 10 to 24 f4 is your, your choice. Visit stp.io slash f10 to pick that up. Sports and portraits are the domain of this huge Fuji 50 to 140 f2.8, a, a great lens that is razor sharp and really one of my favorite portrait lenses of all times to use. Visit stp.io slash f140 to pick that up. It feels a little unbalanced on this XT20. Kind of wish you had a bigger grip, but it works really well. It, another way to shoot portraits that's not quite so big and bulky <laughs> is to pick up the 56 millimeter f12. It's a fast prime lens that works like a full frame 85 millimeter f18 would. Visit stp.io slash f56 to pick it up. It comes in two flavors. 
um, the standard one, and then I think the other one is called APD because it has this appetizing ap ap element <laughs> that improves the bouquet. Um, I've reviewed them both, and I don't see that the APD version is really worth the extra money, though I prefer just to get the standard 56 millimeter f1.2. It's great, super sharp. If you get this big lens and you want to shoot sports or wildlife at a longer range, you can also pick up a teleconverter. Either the 1.4x teleconverter, which multiplies both your shutter speed and your aperture times one, your shutter speed, your focal length and your aperture times 1.4, making it um, like a 200 millimeter f4 lens, basically. Or the 2x teleconverter, which doubles everything, making this a 280 millimeter f5.6 lens. Just gives you extra reach when you need to shoot long distances. They will make focusing a little bit more difficult and stuff's not going to be quite as sharp, but if you need that extra reach, you need that extra reach, right? Another one of my favorite lenses is the 27 millimeter f2.8, which is great and compact and just the perfect kind of walking around lens. If you don't want all the bulk of this, or maybe you want something that's a little better in low light, this 27 millimeter f2.8 lens, just look how small and nice looking that is. It just looks like a little, little classic camera, so handsome. It's a prime. It doesn't zoom in and out and anything, and it doesn't have like a proper marked aperture ring, so it's not using it is not quite the same. But nonetheless, it's compact, and you really won't mind having a having this on a strap and just carrying it around. But you can still get images that are much better than you could out of a smartphone. Another option for longer reach is the Fuji 100 to 400 f5.6 lens, which you can pick up at stp.io slash f400. You might also consider just getting the 50 to 140 and the 2x teleconverter. I know it doesn't get you quite out to 400 millimeters, but that combination is a little bit more versatile because you can use this at shorter range with that fast f2.8 aperture. So get this if you're dedicated to working at long distances and you're not trying to blur the background or shoot portraits. And get this in the teleconverter if you also want to shoot portraits and blur the background. If you get into video recording, you'll notice that the on-camera mic isn't great. <laughs> so you might want to hook up an external mic. Um, people always ask me which mic I'm using, and it's the Sennheiser EW100G3, which you can pick up at stp.io slash g3. It's a wireless lab, so you don't have a, a long cable going to the person that you're recording. Um, you might also check out, look for the G2 versions of this. They're old. You can only pick them up used, but they're just about the same. We use them kind of interchangeably and they can save you a lot of money to get the G2. If you're going to be making prints, I'll point you to another video of mine, which is stp.io slash printit, where in the, we compare 13 different print services in the U.S. to find the best one. I'll give you a hint. It was uh, MPix. <laughs> I don't have an affiliation with them. They just they make the best prints, so check out MPix. You're going to need a tripod. If you don't yet have a tripod and you want a cheap one, pick up the Dolica tripod at stp.io slash tripod1. It's 50 bucks. It's nice and light. It's overall a good tripod for the value. And if you end up getting a serious tripod later, you still might use this as your travel tripod. When you are ready to get a more serious tripod, here is a great Manfrotto tripod with a name that is not at all catchy. <laughs> but you can pick it up at stp.io slash mk190. It's just a great overall tripod um, that's much sturdier than that Dolica. Once again, I'll plug my video books. Stunning Digital Photography is 14 hours of video, free quizzes, uh, practices, and a Facebook group with over 25,000 users. Very helpful, very friendly, not intimidating, who are also learning. They'll help you out, they'll look at your pictures, give you feedback, answer your questions. It is only 10 bucks, the ebook, and you, you help support us. You can also pick up the paperback book for 20 bucks. Go to Amazon, search for Tony Northrup, and you can just see what other people have to say about it so you don't have to trust me. Look at the external objective reviews. We have almost 2,000 reviews on Amazon now, and most of them are five stars. If you get into post-processing, either Lightroom, which is good for organizing your pictures, or Photoshop, which is good for serious heavy-duty editing. Uh, I have books on both of those, so please keep those in mind. And I also have my photography buying guide, which tells you everything you know and need to know about all these lenses and flashes and all this stuff. You can go to stp.io slash store to buy it directly from us, or just go to Amazon. You buy it from us, we ship it worldwide, um, and we also will sell them in bundles where it can save you a few bucks. Please subscribe because we have tons of free videos about photography, and every Thursdays at 5 o'clock uh, Eastern Time, New York City Time, we take a look at your pictures live. So you can send it to us, chat with us, and we will look at your pictures and give you feedback. Subscribe to the channel, it's lots of fun, fun. <laughs> share it with your friends. Bye. Thank you.